Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Marine Corps Lieutenant General Lori Reynolds, who is the Deputy Commandant for Information at the headquarters of the United States Marine Corps. General Reynolds, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. John, thanks. Really uh, appreciate being here. In late 2020, the Marine Corps published MCDP 1-4, which is simply entitled Competing. And coincidentally, we recently had Colonel Bill Vivian on the podcast, whom I think you probably know, General, who was one of the principal authors of this document. Could you please give your perspective on competing? Why, why did the Marine Corps publish this now? Who is the primary audience? And also, do you have any kind of a sense of what the reception has been for this pub? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I'll start with the last question. I think the reception has been generally positive. Um, you know, if you listened, if your listeners listened to the last um, podcast with Bill, uh, you know, Colonel Vivian, you, you'll know that, you know, competing came out of uh, the mandate of the national defense strategy and the return to great power competition. And but I think, you know, where the commandant was with this is that, you know, we all have to kind of challenge the status quo that have been established, you know, over the last 20 years of, you know, fighting. Uh, this is a different fight and we have to have a different mindset. And I think competing helps you get into that mindset of, you know, for us in the Marine Corps, this idea of naval campaigning and in the information environment in particular, getting organized for that competition so that, you know, we, we can, you know, align authorities and do all those things that kind of help us to, um, to get the force and the training and, and the, you know, the kit right. But it also, I think, you know, it, it you know, from, from education of the force, you know, just helping to fundamentally rethink you know, what it is that the military is here to do, who our partners are in great power competition. And, and um, so really timely, I think it's really good. I mean, it's a really good read and it really does help to challenge um, all of us at every echelon uh, for this new fight. Right, so uh, continuing with your expertise in information operations, operations in, in the information environment, uh, so it, information warfare is is not new. Could you review for us the recent evolution from a Marine Corps perspective of information as an instrument of national power and as a war fighting function? So I, I can just tell you, you know, um, that, you know, when most of us were coming up in the service, we, we had the staff function of information operations, which is to say that, you know, um, you had your traditional military activities and, and then, you know, we would, we would have some kind of, you know, um, um, other capabilities, uh, information related capabilities, whether it was electromagnetic warfare or cyber space or influence activities that we would kind of, you know, tack on to our conventional um, operations. I think what's changed now is that you have a couple new warfighting domains. You have cyberspace as a warfighting domain, and that really challenged you, you to think differently um, about how to how to actually conduct the fight. Space as a new warfighting domain. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's, and also the evolution of social media and its impact um, um, on how we fight quite frankly. And, and so all of these are to say that the information environment writ large is now increasingly important. Um, so with great power competition, you know, the rise of gray zone warfare, hybrid warfare, and how some of our adversaries are using the information environment, the requirement now is to just elevate information uh, to the role of the commander. So uh, in 2017, then Secretary Mattis said that information is now a joint function. 
So that requires that we think separately about information and how we deal with it. And then in 2018 in the Marine Corps, then Commandant Neller um, declared that information is the seventh battle space function. So the other battle space functions are, these are functions that commanders must deal with. These are commander level things. So we're talking command and control, fires, maneuver, intelligence, logistics, force protection, and now information. And so, you know, um, some of the work that my team at uh, Deputy Commandant for Information have been doing is to say, what exactly does it mean to apply information as a warfighting function at the commander level at echelons of command? Um, and how do we empower commanders to actually think differently with information? So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. And so you mentioned uh, the, a number of the warfighting domains, uh, including space. Do you, do you foresee, uh, I, I should say, a, a few weeks back, we had a gentleman named August Cole on the podcast. You, you may know who he is, uh, General. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually has an affiliation with the Marine Corps at the at the, the Brute Krulak uh, center mm -hmm. there on Quantico. But he, sure. he, he has uh, put forth uh, a concept uh, for uh, the cognitive domain also being a war fighting function. Looking forward a few years, do you, do you foresee the cognitive domain actually being a, a war fighting domain? I, you know, I don't know, John, I have to wrap my brain around that. I, inside <laughs> information as a war fighting function, for the Marine Corps, we very much are thinking about uh, the cognitive domain. And we deal with that mm -hmm. with things like influence activities, uh, deception activities, but also uh, inf inform activities. That is to say, strategic communications. And what, one of the things that is a little bit different about how you know, the Marine Corps views this, this whole um, area, and, and honestly, the language inside of the Pentagon is is all over the place, right? Um, mm -hmm. The Navy, for example, has uh, information warfare. We call it operations in the information environment for a reason. Uh, and the reason is that, and the reason why I'm the deputy commandant for information and not the deputy commandant for information warfare is because we very much believe that strategic communications is part of this, is part of this competition. And the integration of the strategic narrative with all of the other things that we have to do is is going to be increasingly important and and i know that you know some of your other guests john have spent time talking about the importance of the narrative um there's a lot of good articles out there right now on the importance of the narrative um and winning the narrative and so um so when you go back to the cognitive domain i i don't know i don't know how you would define that when i think about a war fighting domain i'm talking places where you know we have commanders and um, forces and um, uh, mission essential tasks and things. So uh, I think what you're stumbling on uh, with August is we got to get the language down on in this area and, and really be clear about what we mean when we talk about domains or dimensions or environments. Uh, we really just need to have um, a meeting of the, the minds on that so that we all know what we're talking about. I think the good thing is that everybody's thinking about it, right? So it, he, you know, do, do we have to get after the cognitive uh, piece of this? We absolutely do. Yeah, and that is definitely part of the Marine Corps' um, thinking on this for sure. Right, yeah, no, no doubt on all of that. I, I think of the cognitive domain as, as almost like um, uh, the uh, Internet of Things, and it's like, uh, you know, combat at the edge, if you will, if the edges are individual brains. But yeah, no, that make, makes a lot of sense. There's, there's uh, a, a lot of change happening, a lot of uh, definitions that still have to be uh, uh, evolved and iterated on until, uh, I, I guess, we, the collective we, the joint force, you know, settles on some, um, some, some common terminology. Uh, but you, you started mentioning various aspects uh, of your purview. So per perhaps uh, uh, you could tell our audience a little bit more about that. We, a couple of months ago, we had Brian Russell on the podcast, who is the commanding officer of 2MIG, 
down in Camp Lejeune, and he gave an overview of, of what the MIG is and its uh, components. But you know, some in our audience may be unfamiliar with, with your office and your role. Do you think you could give a, a quick 101 as far as you know, what, what your office is and, and, and what yeah. you do and some of the major components? Yeah, sure thing. So at about the same time as the Marine Corps uh, created the MEF information groups, so that was uh, then called Force Design 2025, right? Um, the, the MIGs came out of that. Um, again, because I, at the time, General Neller uh, knew that, you know, the increasing importance of the information environment and going to have to fight for information. And he used to say, we're going to have to fight to get to the fight, you know, because we knew then that things were changing. So at about the same time, um, he also knew that we needed to elevate the um, um, our thinking at the staff level. So the service exists to organize, train, equip, provide doctrine and policy. And until 2017, we didn't have at the three-star level, anyone that was really um, working any of these kinds of issues. Um, so inside Deputy Commandant for Information, which was stood up in 2017, um, I took the job in 2018. Um, we, we have uh, the two biggest divisions are the intelligence, uh, the director of intelligence works for me and uh, the deputy um, Don CIO. So I have the CIO function and all of the team that does uh, uh, the work for the network, you know, tactical edge all the way back into the Pentagon. So the network intelligence, we have a, a maneuver division that we created. Um, in fact, right now it's being led by a former MIG commander, Colonel Jordan Walzer. Uh, and there is where we think about how do you maneuver in the information environment? So signals intelligence, um, uh, uh, MSO operations, uh, he is kind of the touch point for the MIG commanders in terms of um, uh, hearing from them very often, how do we scale what they're learning uh, and reacting to whatever programs or record might be of important to them, OSINT, any of these new capabilities that would be Colonel Walzer in the maneuver division he, uh, he happens to be the Oxfield manager for, for the cyber uh, MOS because we're still refining that MOS. Mm -hmm. um, I have a plans and strategy division um, and that is basically my, my up and out division, integration with the joint staff. So all the work on, on concepts around information, the information advantage concept. Um, that's where I interact as well with our wargaming um, uh, folks down in Quantico. So we're doing a really uh, series of war games right now on competition uh, at McQuill, which are fascinating. And that would be my plans and strategy folks. These are the folks that are also working. They, they would uh, interact with the doctrine folks um, at Quantico to make sure that information is embedded in all of our new doctrine. Um, I have a workforce division who's there to help me think about new skill sets for civilians. We know that retention of our civilian workforce, whether it's in the, you know, any of the technology fields or the intelligence fields, we're gonna to have to up our game to retain the best talent. So we're thinking through that. I have a war room where my chief technical officer is. That's where we think about uh, agile methodologies for um, just solving complex problems that the Marine Corps has. Um, that's where we think about artificial intelligence and uh, the integration of data and, and um, really working harder at, uh, at getting our data right in the Marine Corps. But there's also a section in that war room that has information mods where we, um, we innovate with some R&D dollars and some of the uh, combat support agencies and try to make some of the equi equipment that we have better. So um, that would be the war room. And then I have, um, uh, I have another small division that works with the Navy on some strategic competition things. Um, so that's kind of, that gives you the feel for DCI uh, writ large. It's, um, it's really exciting, um, hard sometimes to bring folks together and find the common um, uh, touch points, but, but uh, we've come a long way and uh, um, it's really an exciting time to be there. Wow, that is an astonishing scope of operations. And, and then on top of that, you are a dual-hatted with Northcom and Cybercom, are you not? 
Um, no, I I was uh, uh, the commander of Marfor Strat uh, wow. as well as DCI, but the Marine Corps just made some uh, key choices here uh, last year, and we stood up a Marfor Space, um, and um, what we decided to do there was to dual hat uh, Marine Forces Cyberspace and Marine Forces Space. Wow. So right now, uh, uh, General um, Jerry Glavy up there in Fort Meade is also a Morphor space. And wow. we have uh, we have kind of reduced our footprint at Strat. So I really don't hold that uh, that billet anymore. Oh, okay. Well, that's 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 five pounds that you can take out of your pack, I guess. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Now instead of a instead of a hundred and five pound pack, it's only a hundred pound pack. E it's easy, all good. Easy, Team sport. <laughs> easy day. Um, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, in, in the middle of March, uh, the Commandant, General Berger, along with Air Force Chief of Staff, General Brown, they uh, published an article in War on the Rocks. And uh, but by the way, all, all of these items will be linked in, in the show notes for our audience. But they, the, the article was called Redefine Readiness or Lose. And uh, these two service chiefs describe in this article uh, what they call a, a fleeting window of opportunity for us to adapt and modernize the joint force, um, along with a rather urgent call to action. What is your role as DCI in the Marine Corps' modernization efforts, and what items are you pursuing with urgency? Look, I think, I think thing number one is all things support force design, right? So as you think about all of the things that uh, the, the Marine Corps is trying to get after right now uh, to become more agile, uh, lighter, um, global, globally um, uh, relevant, not, not that we weren't in the past, but everything that we would do, you know, to support the effort in, for example, the Indo-Pacific area, uh, the expectation is all of that work would apply globally so that we, you know, never give anybody to doubt the fact that we are still the expeditionary force and readiness that we've always been. But from a network or a intelligence perspective, you, you got to wrap your brain around the fact that these adversaries that we have today are globally uh, positioning themselves. And so I'll start with Intel. Um, we need you know, the best um, national level intelligence down to the tactical level. And so that comes with it, policy change, it comes with it, a kit change, um, mm -hmm. a trade craft uh, change. So there's, there's all kinds of uh, good work that's going on to kind of um, have the ISR enterprise that we have here in the Marine Corps, which is really good, think more globally and how do, how do we, um, operationalize it, if you will. Um, mm. How does one, two, and three MEF work together as an ISR enterprise uh, against a global competitor? The same is true, by the way, on the network, right? So we know that we will be contested on the network. And so that this is, uh, we've been working really hard on this, um, taking best ad advantage of the technology that's available to us, right? High velocity compute, artificial intelligence, um, data needed, wherever data is needed, data needs to, to get there. And so I already mentioned trying to get data right in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, you know, and, and then thinking about command and control, right, John? So, so the days of large static command posts are, do are done. We need mobile, agile points of presence, right? And so as a combo, how do you think about that? How do you think about, you know, pace plans or, you know, primary alternate contingency and emergency, like your method of uh, uh, reaching out and communicating, how do you do that at Echelon over large distributed areas? Um, really hard work, um, but the technology, you know, on the other hand is better than it's ever been, right? And so um, how do we kind of challenge the acquisition process to move as quickly as we possibly can um, to kind of meet some of these new mandates? So. I mean, really across the entire portfolio, you know, Intel, C4, it's, it's fundamentally not 
not negating what we have done for the last 20 years because the whole mm -hmm. find, fix, finish thing is now just applicable at scale on a global. And so now we have to stack new capabilities on top of that, right? So we need to continue to refine some of all that learning that we that we got really good at, right? Um, so, and then again, adding a brand new portfolio, adding information as a warfighting function um, and really embedding this thinking into commanders at Echelon. And I'll just say that, you know, you know, the MIGs, so proud of them. You know, we really didn't do a lot in 2018 when we created the MIGs. We said, we said, change your name and get her done. Um, because we knew that we needed to learn, you know, what, what is it with just, you know, a few really smart folks and authority, right? So when I was a MEF headquarters group commander, uh, I, had, I had no um, expectation that I would actually tell the COM battalion operationally what to do. They worked for the G6 mm. and the Intel and radio battalions worked for the G2. The idea with the MIGs now is you now own them. You are commanding and controlling and you are integrating those capabilities. But we are learning so much now. Um, and we're, you know, again, we're, we're building on everything that they've done. We're creating new doctrine. We're building new programs of record to enable them. We're trying to scale everything that they're doing. And so there's just, there's a lot there's a lot going on, integrating defensive cyberspace capabilities and, and creating new partners. Um, and so we're on a journey. That's all I can say. I just keep saying we're on a journey. Uh, we're all learning. And I think, you know, being a learning organization and making sure that you are capable of listening, hearing, you know, building that into your portfolio and then keep moving. That's, that's what we're all about right now. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for all of that. Uh, one of the themes that uh, it comes up over and over again, and I know that you're no stranger to this, General, is uh, the necessity, the, the imperative, actually, for partnering and collaborating uh, in ways that, I, I mean, partnering ha has always been important, but there seems to be a renewed emphasis and making sure that uh, yeah. uh, yeah, we, we are doing this like we've never done before. So what, what are some of the agencies that you find yourself partnering with the most? And could you also talk a little bit about which agencies you'd like to develop some stronger relationships with? And, and finally, what are your thoughts about corporate engagement relative to national security? Yeah. So, um, look, I think in the information environment, it really is a game of authorities and it's, you know, being highly maneuverable, you know, I call it stacking authorities. Um, you can, you can, you can talk, talk to it about, you know, maneuverable with your authorities, but the way that you do that is you just create partnerships. You go out, you, you figure out who else has like, um, you know, objectives or end states and you figure out, you know, uh, you know, how you can work together. Um, so, I'll, you know, I'll, let me just start with the United States Navy. I mean, and I should have said that in the last question, you know, uh, naval integration for the Marine Corps is, is the future and, and it's, it's a really fun time, you know, to be in the hallway right now and you know, figuring out, for example, how, you know, the Marine Corps OIE capability can partner most effectively with the Navy's IW capability. You know, they're really, really good at systems confrontation at sea and so forth. And so just finding, you know, those really um, strong touch points where we can organize together. So all of the other services, obviously, I mean, we're really keeping track on, you know, how the Army and the Air Force are developing their um, uh, information capabilities. The Coast Guard, you know, we're working on a product called the uh, Military Power, uh, Maritime Power in the Information Environment. So it's the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps. How do we work together to uh, implement Advantage at Sea, which is which is the strategy for maritime um, operations and those three services? Um, obviously, the three-letter agencies, uh, um, any of the intelligence agencies uh, that have a role to play, the State Department, the Global Engagement uh, Center, which is getting increasingly effective. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it, one of the things about the information environment is, and you know, it's, it's one of the talking points with all of our commanders is that it doesn't respect lines on a map. It doesn't respect, you know, your areas of operation, your areas of responsibility. So you have to think differently. That opens the window for every partner that might have another objective. There are some wonderful allies who think like we do in this space. Some of our traditional allies are wonderful partners and they can do things um, uh, in their own national interests that happen to coincide with ours. Um, other combatant commanders, US Cyber Command, US SOCOM uh, has a tremendous history here. Um, so uh, we're open to all of those. Um, mm -hmm. With regard to industry, I think, you know, my attention, um, you know, I mentioned technology and all of our modernization initiatives. We can't do it without um, our industry partners. Um, and so you know, some of the work that the department is doing to provide secure places for small businesses and others to kind of innovate inside, inside, for example, our DevSecOps environment. Mm -hmm. um, those kinds of initiatives that we're working on to help uh, more players with good ideas, come help us. Um, so uh, training and education, John, right? So we have conducted a couple different pilots with our, um, for data science with Amazon and uh, Northern Virginia Community College. So can we think differently about training Marines on advanced skill set based on Amazon's um, uh, curriculum and using Nova's instructors? Not the way we did in the past, but doesn't mean we don't have to do it differently in the future. And so those have been really, really good pilots. So again, you know, you got to challenge the status quo. You know, uh, we, we uh, it's a new day and we got to think of new ways to solve today's problems. So. Right, right. I was just listening to uh, the Phoenix cast, uh, which is uh, another uh cyber related podcast uh, run by a couple of Marines, I think. Anyway, what, one of their recent episodes, and I'll, I'll put a link to this in the show notes, but they were discussing how there's a, uh, a, a been a shift in PME or like self PME uh, towards Marines and, uh, you know, the uh, civilian work, workforce within DOD as well, uh, pursuing more micro credentials which are indicators of competencies in various different aspects of the cyber environment, for example. So, and I should have mentioned, by the way, I thought you were gonna mention the Phoenix Cast uh, work, uh, work with our cyber auxiliary. We created a Marine Corps cyber auxiliary about two years ago. And, uh, and, and basically what that is, is we, we said to industry, academia, anybody who wanted to partner with the Marine Corps to solve some of our problems. Um, and uh, it's been wonderful. So, you know, they can't do on keyboard operations, obviously, but they can help us think through some of our problems. Um, and so we have a cyber auxiliary uh, in the Marine Corps. Um, but, but yeah, John, uh, PME in some of these technology areas has to change. So uh, we've been working with Naval Postgraduate School to, for a kind of a stacked certificates program. Um, so maybe I don't have time to send one of my, you know, high speed cyber guys to Monterey, California for two years at a time, but can I, can I send them for three to four months at a time and, and get certificates? And what we have learned is that um, education is really important to, to some of these Marines. I can't pay them what they're worth. Marine Corps will never be able to pay some of these smart uh, young cyber operators um, what they're worth. But if we can retain them long enough um, to retirement, perhaps if when they retire, they can you know, walk out with a master's degree, that, that's a win. So we're looking at all of those kinds of things um, to kind of uh, you know, just incentivize retention, but also to help them while they are in uniform and give them the most you know, up-to-date thinking and education on uh, some of these skill sets. I'll tell you the other one is cloud technologies. Um, mm -hmm. We're learning how difficult that might be. Um, so 
do we need a new MOS? Do we have to have a certificate-based program for some of these you know, other technologies that we know we're gonna rely on? Um, maybe. Um, so uh, again, data science, you know, all of these things right. um, are uh, uh, their discovery areas for us. And, and again, I'm just, you know, trying to encourage folks to keep their, um, uh, don't dismiss it, you know, don't dismiss mm. any ideas, bring them to us and let us figure out if they have merit and if we can figure out how to do it. Right. <laughs> Another uh, line that runs through everything that you've been talking about, Laurie, is uh, uh, it, you, you, there's there's a quote from you that I found online, which I, I think is uh, you're you're well known for saying this. Possibly is that it's not the it, it, it's no longer the big that eat the small; it's the fast that eat the slow. And so, whether we're talking about uh, these micro credentials or uh, speeding up the adoption of new technology or, you know, just using data science and machine learning to, 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 to accelerate the orient and observe portion of the OODA loop. I mean, all of this is, is about making quicker decisions exactly. and, and adapting faster. Yeah, John, that's, so that's exactly right. I, I am, um, the way that I have come to describe operations in the information environment for Marines, especially, and it seems to resonate is, I said, look, guys, whether I'm talking about the technical side of ops in the information environment or the cognitive side, I'm either talking about the OODA loop or kill chains. I'm talking about red kill chains and the red OODA loop, or I'm talking defending blue kill chains and uh, defending uh, blue uh, OODA loops. So I want to be inside the adversary's decision cycle every single time. We want to do everything that we can to fracture his or her ability to make a decision um, or to execute that fires campaign while we are defending our own. And, and we're gonna use non-kinetic, we're gonna use kinetic, we're gonna use space, cyber, influence, deception. Um, it's really about how you package all of those things and why. And so, you know, speed is everything there. Right, the, uh, you know, gr growing up in the Marine Corps, you know, I you know, learned about the OODA loop and, uh, I don't want to say that the OODA loop concept became, you know, just kind of like status quo uh, background assumption, but it was kind of a, a bit of a background assumption. But it seems today that the OODA loop concept is like vividly coming to the foreground as one of the more important concepts as we prosecute our challenges today. Yeah, even even when you, you go back to your original question about, you know, competing, you know, competing in order to do what, you know, to deter, to dissuade, to, you know, change the adversary's thinking, um, uh, to, on the other side, to, you know, build allies and partners to, you know, shape the environment. It all goes back to that cognitive dimension. Can you just, can you outpace them and you constantly ensuring that you have the upper hand and you have gained that overmatch in terms of, you know, the information environment. I mean, that, that really is what we're trying to get after here. Well, um, I'd like to transition the conversation just a little bit, if I may, and, you know, ask you about, you know, you know, so you, you dialogue frequently with, uh, with, with young Marines. You, you've done so your entire career as a leader of Marines, but you know, what are the kinds of things that, that you tell young Marines today? Or, or, or it it's probably doesn't even have to be specific to Marines, but what are the kinds of things that, that you emphasize to uh, young service members when it comes to what we need to do today in order to dominate the information environment? Yeah. I, I guess I would I would probably just say three quick things here, John. The, the first is really for commanders is, you know, we, we need to kind of demystify, you know, what it is that we're talking about with information or ops in the information environment. And and the way that I try to do that is to say, look, you know, you're you're all familiar as commanders with, you know, um, having to live on a forward operating base somewhere and having to think about avenues of approach and having to think about know, how you would defend that, how you would apply your resources, you know, um, to, to um, 
uh, uh, understanding how to see to that forward operating base. The same is true in some of these other domains, space, you know, or really cyber. And so, because because what you you need commanders to understand and ask the next question of their staffs about things like cyber key terrain, things like are we properly defending those blue kill chains? You know, do your commos understand, for example, does your intel officer know all of the avenues of approach that an adversary might take um, to get after your kill chains? And so, um, you know, just trying to find easy ways to describe, you know, these new domains that we're talking about. I think on the, just, you know, the young Marine perspective, you know, the, the way that I kind of try to describe where we, I think we are as a service is, and this is not me, this is, you know, General Bill Bowers, you know, he's brilliant. He's, he's out at MCI PAC right now, but we talk a lot about you know, where we are in history. And he talks, he says, ma'am, in cyberspace, you know, this is our Bella Wood moment. And I said, Bill, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, in, in you know, 1912, 1914, you know, the, the Marine Corps adopted the Springfield rifle in 1908. And, in, and, and decided then that every Marine was gonna be a rifleman, right? So that's when we started, you know, doing, you know, you had to, you had to uh, qualify with the Springfield at recruit training or you weren't a Marine. And so then sure enough, you know, we take it to Nicaragua and so forth, but in Bella Wood, it was the Marines ability to hit at 500 yards, what the Germans couldn't, that really enabled that win. And so, so, if here we are in 2021, and this is our Bella Wood moment in cyberspace, what does that mean that we need to do now to teach Marines about just basic, the security of the network, what their behavior online means, what it doesn't mean, how to act professionally. So what are those just basic skill sets of marksmanship, if you will, in the cyber domain? I just think that's really helpful perspective as we are right now thinking about how we educate you know, the force, um, you know, uh, media literacy, Marines need to understand when they are working online, what in the world is happening to them. Mm. You know, I heard somebody say just this week that, you know, this whole idea of algorithmic warfare, it can be benign or it can be malign, but it is happening right now. And it is happening on your personal device or it's happening, you know, elsewhere that you go. Uh, um, so just, Giving the Marines the basic skill set to know that this is happening, I think is is, is really important. Because if we think that our adversaries are not going to come after the United States military and impact our will to fight, we're wrong. It's going to happen. Right, right. And I I commend to our listeners to go back and listen to an episode uh, that we did with the Army Cyber Institute. Uh, a couple of researchers there talked about uh, force protection in the cognitive domain. And uh, even going all the way to the point of uh, the 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 will to fight at at a nation state level, and I think you, when you were mentioning um, algorithmic warfare, uh, that gets to that that slow creeping insidious um, mindset right. shift that is possible not only within the military force but within the populace in general. A lot of work to do in that area, I think, to just educate the force uh, more deliberately on how all of this is working. Lori, I'd, I'd like to close, uh, if I may. Yeah, we, we've already talked about PME and some of the um, some of the changes that are taking place out of necessity uh, relative to this struggle that we find ourselves in. But uh, could could you perhaps recommend a, a, a book mm -hmm. or two that our audience might not be aware of, which uh, is may, maybe some of the the, the go to or the, yeah. uh, the uh, things that are on your nightstand that uh, are helpful to, to understand the challenge that we're, we're dealing with. I, I got a couple things going right now. I, I mean, I, look, some of the basics, I think certainly anything that Peter Singer, you know, uh, is writing right now, obviously right. like war um, is, is gonna be a classic. I, I read also a book um, that I thought was really good, easy read. It was called War in 140 Characters. Um, it talks about how social media is is reshaping conflict, and uh, the author is uh, I think he's Greek. David uh, Patrick Karakos is his, is his name, but he is he's in the Russia Ukraine conflict, 
talks a little bit about uh, some of the things that Israel did in social media, but it's just a really, really good read to kind of wrap your brain around, you know, the, the impact of social media in modern conflict. Um, Simon Sinek, you know, the infinite game uh, that speaks to competition and how we, th how we think as military professionals about applying those kinds of um, thoughts uh, to campaigning. Um, and, and I just uh, yesterday read a really good article that came out of the Modern War Institute. I think they're doing really good work up there called The Shape of Things to Come. And it, it was uh, written by uh, one of the professors up there, Kyle Wolfley, but he talks about using soft power and the need to think more deliberately in some of our uh, national um, uh, strategic documents about shaping. And I think he's spot on. So those would be some things to start with. All right. Well, fantastic. We will have links to all of those resources in the show notes. And uh, uh, we wish you, General Reynolds, Godspeed as you and your Marines uh, prosecute this challenge. And thank you so much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. A lot of fun, John. Thank you. Appreciate what you're doing. Semper Fi. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.